Some call me Steve, Dad, Husband or Friend. Others might call me Boss, Coach or Mentor. Today you can call me the Leadership Hacker. Thanks for listening in, I really appreciate it. My job as the Leadership Hacker is to hack into the minds, experiences, habits and learning of great leaders, C-suite executives, authors and development experts so that I can assist you developing your understanding and awareness of leadership. I'm Steve Rush and I'm your host today. I'm the author of Leadership Cake. I'm a transformation consultant and leadership coach and can't wait to start sharing all things leadership with you. Today's special guest is Rasha Hazanin. She is a Vice President and Executive Director at Train Technologies, where she runs a centre for healthy and efficient spaces. Rasha is also a Board of Advisor member and Board member for a number of technology and climate tech companies and councils. But before we get a chance to speak with Rasha, it's a Leadership Hacker News. In the news today, we explore whether or not organisations and leaders are taking ESG seriously. And if they do, how it can directly correlate to great results. The letters ESG of course stand for Environmental, Social and Governance, and are typically how organisations structure activities and commitments to each, be it greenhouse gases and emissions and waste, that's E, staff, labour, relations, employee safety, that's the S, or board diversity in supply chain management, that's the G. And while most organisations will have a view and a lens, having tactical and focused activities can be really relevant to the business world. And more and more shareholders and stakeholders, as well as customers, staff and consumers, are starting to take more notice around ESG and ESG ratings. The momentum towards ESG has not slowed with the pandemic. The crisis has intensified and reinforced the important issues of ESG. George Serafame, a Harvard Business School professor and ESG expert, said COVID-19 has caused us to dive deeper and integrate our ESG inside organisations around their management and their strategy. And it's no longer just about feel-good issues we're talking about even more important value drivers. So let's have a look at how ESG can really drive shareholder return and maximize value for the organization. In one HBR study, they found that $1 investment yielded $28 return over 20 years for companies that focused on ESG. And those that didn't focus on ESG measures only returned $14. In a recent study by McKinsey's, they explained that executing ESG effectively can help combat rising operating expenses, affecting operating profits as much as 60%. If leaders want to reap such rewards, they should immediately begin measuring ESG metrics alongside other KPIs. Of course, companies can then demonstrate what they measure and the impact that it has to returns. And ESG helps with talent too. According to Wharton Professor Peter Capelli, most hiring is a result of drastically poor retention. This issue has only been compounded in recent years with Mercer's Global Talent Trends 2020 calling the Great Recession, revealing that nearly half, that's 46% of C-suites believe that their organisation is ill-equipped to attain, attract the right talent. Though ESG and talent may seem unrelated, they're deeply correlated. A study from Marsha McLennan found that employers with an attractive ESG strategy attract and retain the best talent in the marketplace. In addition, saw performance roughly 25% higher than average employers. There's an enormous amount of evidence pointing that ESG is a value driver and will be even more of one moving forward. So if leaders want to win, they should be putting those three letters, ESG, at the heart of their strategies. That's been Leadership Hacking News. As always, please get in touch. Any news, stories, or insights that you might have. Russia Hazanin is our special guest on today's show. She is the Vice President of Innovation and Product Excellence for Train Technologies, 
a former executive with global businesses, Rasha now leads the Centre for Healthy and Efficient Spaces as Executive Director for Train Technologies. Rasha, welcome to the Leadership Hacker podcast. Thank you, Steve. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So you and I have taken an absolute age to try and get together, right, with the moving schedules, global pandemic, but we're finally here at last. Yes, agreed. It's It's been a little crazy. I mean, every time we think there's a, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel, there's um, more to come. And so we're, I think we're all trying to navigate it as best we can. Indeed. And the first time you and I met, we were talking around climate change and the role that train technology plays in that. And if anything, timing's perfect because the world has just really grabbed hold of the whole climate change initiative, hasn't it? You bet. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into that in a moment. Before we do, though, we love our guests to give our audience the opportunity to share their backstory and understand a little bit about how they've arrived to do what they do. Tell us a little bit about Russia. You bet. So um, I, it, I'm, I'm originally Egyptian. I uh, moved to the United States very young. My mom was um, was came here to study. Um, and then, you know, I spent my formative years between sort of the U.S. and, and the Middle East. Um, came back to um, to to do university actually in Canada, so I am also Canadian. Um, then then worked for a few years, went to came back to the U.S., um, did a master's, then sort of dug in on the digital side of things. So I worked in Silicon Valley for a number of years. Um, decided I was really interested in sustainability with a big S uh, versus sort of sustainability with a little S. Um, sort of doing stuff at home and composting and doing all the cool stuff. I wanted to really understand how I could impact um, uh, climate change at the time. I will not uh, date myself by telling you when the time was, but it was before climate change was cool. Um, but I realized that um, sort of the combination of, of digital technologies with actually the industrial world was going to have a much bigger impact than the combination of digital technologies with the consumer world, which was kind of um, all the rage at the time. This was the early days of Amazon. Again, I'm dating myself. The early days of Amazon, you know, I had an iPod before the iPhone came out, which a, a lot of listeners may, may not remember. Yeah. Um, but but um, it, it became clear to me that actually the integration of digital and industrial was really um, where it was going to be. And uh, so I went back and did a doctorate uh, focusing on sustainability, but really focusing on industrial businesses made my change from Silicon Valley um, to sort of oil and gas and power, uh, finished my doctorate. And then um, I was really on the supply side, I would say, of climate change. So power generation, um, you know, fossils versus renewables, et cetera. And then um, at the time, Ingersoll Rand, which then became Train Technologies, um, came to me and said, hey, how would you like to be on the demand side? And they presented a very compelling argument about what it means to be on the de on the demand side of of, um, of, of climate change and really understanding how to reduce consumption through efficiency um, and so on. And so they convinced me and I um, came, I joined the company to do uh, product excellence and uh, innovation and have, have never looked back since. Awesome. So where did the bug come from around? Because the whole career so far for you has been around sustainability. And, yes. And, and where did that kind of little S turn into a big S? Um, for me, you know, so I'll, I'll share a very personal story. I, um, when I was working in Silicon Valley, I, I got, I got, re I got really sick. I was in the hospital for about, for about nine days in, in the intensive care unit. I was very young. Um, and until that point I was kind of invincible and so was the world. And then you kind of examine your own vulnerabilities at that point. And then you, you, for me, it was more about what, it, you know, you get to a point where, it, it it was like what what do you want to do with your life, and um and and you want to do something that matters, right? And and you also want to do something you're good at and that you enjoy. So I knew I enjoyed building things. I enjoyed, um, you know, building teams from scratch, doing things that were completely new. So innovation was kind of in what I loved to do. Um, and so when it came to where I could apply my um my skill set in a way that would really help, um, it really, you know, sustainability became, became sort of part of the narrative for me personally, right? It was like, you know, how do we make businesses more sustainable? How do we make it better for people? 
all over the world, not just uh, people in certain economic uh, situations or in certain countries. Um, and how does that you the, the ubiquity of climate, how do you impact that? It was a big problem to solve and it seems really overwhelming. And that was kind of, you know, it became a big puzzle for me. Like it's overwhelming. How do you break it down into kind of bite sized pieces? And so I started to understand it more. Um, and, and I wanted to really work on, on something that would, that would really like change the world. And, you know, at the, t at the time there were, you know, apps were, um, were, were, were growing in, in, um, in popularity. And so people would make apps for everything. Right. I think at one point there was an iFart app. It was just, it was, <laughs> I was like, that's not what I want to work on. Um, and so, so it, it, I started to really sort of get the bug back for, you know, industrial businesses. I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. Um, my master's is in industrial engineering. So I kind of missed that sort of the tangibility of of being part of a of an of a of a business that builds things um but i also knew that it was that combination of my digital experience bringing it to sort of the sort of the the, the sort of what i the heavy metal type industry that was really going to make a difference and every time i looked at something that was made better by digital it was like the gains were humongous and and so for me it was really about doing something of import with your sort of your superpowers. And that's kind of how I, how I landed here. Some of it was serendipity, of course. Um, but a lot of it was, was really just having a, um, a an internal sort of self-reflection over a period where you kind of were your most vul vulnerable, I think. It's a great reflection. So when it comes to climate change, our listeners are probably thinking, you know, traditional ESG measures, it's unlikely that when they do think of climate measures that they think of indoors yeah. and being drawn to consider indoor spaces. What's the reason it doesn't get the same profile maybe as some of the other more explicit things that folk are undertaking right now? Absolutely. Great question. And it's a question I think about a lot. So historically, it has taken a very long time, even for climate measures, to become acknowledged as "quote unquote" real, or um, or something that we need to pay attention to. Um, it took focused effort by scientists and researchers. Um, it took, you know, um, seasons and seasons of intense weather um, for for sort of this very deliberate approach to take hold among the population. Um, indoor climates are very similar. They're intangible, right? Like the, your indoor climate is fine until it's not. Right. And it has to be really bad for you to want to do something. Like just think about your own home, right? Like you're in the ho your home. If you're a little cold, you put on a blanket, right? You know, if it's a little stuffy, you kind of, you open a window or you kind of deal with it. And it's not until like somebody burns something that you're like, okay, I got to turn on the hood vent and I've got to clear out the smoke. And it's got to really be irritating. And, and humans tend to go to the bad. Like I want to make the bad better. I rarely want to make the good better. If it's good, it's fine. And indoor spaces are no different. The impact of negative indoor environments is chronic. It's not acute. So it happens over time and, and it could be so many factors. And it's like, is it genetic? Is it this? Is it that? Why do I have asthma? Um, and, and so you kind of are, it's, it's in the South here in the United States, we call it the boiling frog syndrome, right? If you put a frog in really hot water, it jumps right out. But if you put a frog in cold water and you heat up the water slowly, it can boil to death. I know it's very gruesome, but without realizing that that's what's happening to, to it. And that's kind of how indoor environments are. You can't see it. Most of the times you can't smell it. You can't feel it. And so, so these indoor environments are not given as much attention by individuals. Mm. And also people perceive climate change to be an outside thing. They don't actually make the association that it's everything around us. Inside, exactly. And so we, we were so focused on planetary health and sort of, you know, our very existence that we don't always then come back and think about human health. Yeah. And, and so, and if you just think about ESG metrics, um, 
the the E gets a lot of attention. The S gets a little bit of attention, but not nearly as much. Mm. And human health is really a part of that social piece, right? So if you yeah. think about you know environmental, social, and governance, that social piece, that human health, the the health of employees, uh, the health of communities. It's just, it's something that's very big. It's very nebulous, very much like climate change, but hasn't gotten the same attention. And people don't realize that, you know, you experience 90% of the outdoors in indoors, right? Because that's where you spent most of your, spend most of your time. And if you're bringing outdoor air in, um, if you're bringing in, you know, outdoor light, you're, you're bringing that in, but you're not, you don't think about it that way because those walls are up and it feels very safe. Um, inside and and you could be creating um, some some sort of some negative health effects or maybe not negative health effects, but they're not super positive, right? They're right. they're okay. Yeah. What are the things that contribute to inside sustainability? The the things that are around us at work and at home that we can be thoughtful about. That's another really great question. So, uh, I think that what people most um, associate with is thermal comfort, right? Am I hot? Am I too hot? Am I too cold? If I'm too warm, you know, I can't sleep. I can't work. Um, I, I can't, yeah, I can't get creative. I have to sort of, um, um, get to the right temperature and that's absolutely part of it. But you also have a number of other factors. Air quality is another, uh, is one of the main ones, um, different levels of what we've historically measured as a proxy, um, CO2 can, can, can improve or, or decrease productivity and, and the amount of, the amount of CO2 in a space, um, can make you sleepy. But it can also make it make it very hard for you to think and process information and complete tasks. Um, in addition, you know, with respect to air, you know, there's compounds that are generated all the time, either by the materials in your room or by activities of people. Those are we call them volatile organic compounds. Those can be pretty harmful. They can be irritants. Um, you hear about allergens. So air quality is a huge is a huge is a huge part of it. Lighting is another part of it. We've seen a lot of focus on lighting recently with the, the capability that LED gives you. So when you had incandescent bulbs, you know, it was just, it was one temperature, um, it was on or off. Um, and so you just, you took it for granted, the productivity that came with the introduction of electricity and indoor lighting with far outweighed any potential issues with lighting. But as we started to have uh, more access to light emitting diodes, now you could vary dimness. Um, so light intensity, you could vary the temperature of the light, is it white? Is it yellow? Is it sort of darker or lighter? You see daylight bulbs come out. Um, does it simulate daylight? Um, so lighting is a, has a huge component on, um, on our circadian rhythm, but it also has a huge, um, plays a huge part in how, um, how well we process, we also process information and so on. So, so the, the third one here, um, is, is lighting. Um, and that's part of a bigger sort of uh, uh, piece around visual comfort. And that includes things like outside views. It includes things like, is there enough greenery? You know, our bodies are programmed to feel better when we're exposed to things that are good around us. And, and we are, we're programmed to love plants and, and love um, outside views and so on. So so lighting and, and visual comfort is is really important. And, and, and so the last part of this is really um, is really acoustics. Um, and so, so acoustics is really about n sound and noise and, and, and really poor acoustics that you get from either equipment in a building or, or even externally coming in. So outside noise pollution, um, can have a huge impact on how productive you are, how well you sleep. So you might be able to sleep, you might be able to work, but the quality of that sleep and that work matters. And that has a lot to do with with ambient noise, whether it's noise intensity or noise frequency. That's really insightful, actually. And as you were spinning through those different themes, I'm I'm putting myself in that scenario in my office right. and thinking about, oh, I'm not I'm not got enough light here, or or, you know, I know how frustrated I get when I hear some outside noise and I'm trying to and I get distracted easily. Right. They're all things that contribute to that. So not only is that sustainable, that absolutely has a direct correlation to people's well-being, doesn't it? Exactly. That's exactly right. Right. So we think about LED lights, for example, we'll use the lighting example as being a phenomenal way to reduce energy intensity um, in in the home or in the office. Right. So you see all these sort of LED um, projects where 
I'm like, I'm going out and replacing all of the lighting in a skyscraper or all of the lighting in a mall. But what you don't understand is what we what we, we were starting to understand is that that also improves well-being. So, though you know, that technology has enabled us to vary lighting temperature in a way to make, you know, and, and you know, commercial and commercial um, um, organizations have known this for a very long time. Right. The, the type of lighting you have changes your buying behavior. And so if I want to buy something, it's got to have the right lighting around it in order for me to to um, to be attracted to buying that. Or if I'm at a restaurant, I have to have the right ambiance in order for me to feel relaxed or romantic or whatever it is you're you're aspiring to do in terms of the restaurant. Right. LED lights have turbocharged that. Right. So so in an in an effort to reduce energy intensity and improve outdoor kind of sustainability um, or, or the, the carbon footprint of the built environment, we've, we've also introduced a tool that can improve human health indoors, but you have to use that tool. So even though, for example, LED lighting is very dimmable, most switches are still on off. Well, the dimmability of light is very important, right? You need to reduce light intensity throughout the day so that you can sleep at night, so you can be healthy the next day, so you can be productive. And we just, we're still learning in the built environment how to do that. Air quality is no different. Acoustics are no different, right? Hmm. And so as we're starting to learn about the impact of these different elements on human health, we can start to change how we build things, how we implement these systems in a way to take full advantage of not only the their impact on sustainability, on, on climate, it, the big climate, but also their impact of the, the, the indoor climate on human health and start to tune these environments in a way that allow you to have different environments for different situations. It's far more scientific than most people give this credit, right? Absolutely. You, you, you're talking about it in almost a forensic way, which I love, by the way. I think it's really insightful. But I, I wonder how many people have to struggle with getting as thoughtful about that. It's it, You're absolutely right. And we did a, a, a survey recently of just homeowners, right? So commercial spaces are a little bit different because – um, because a lot of times, you know, facility managers and building owners are really focused on employees, but the home tends to be where kind of your average consumer is. And when we talk about indoor air quality, for example, it's like, so what are the types of things you would do to improve your air quality? It's like, oh, I'll light a candle. And you're like, oh my, right? Because it's like, <laughs> okay, that's, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> Except, um, you know, there, there's so much more to air chemistry you know, than, um, than lighting a candle and you could be making it worse. Okay. Um, it, it, funny story. We we're doing a comp a story. We're doing a project with a company in India. Um, and they, and it's a, it's an indoor air quality se sensor and they put it in these locations and, and every day, um, at around the same time, they would see these, um, these particulates go up, right. And particulates are not great for a lot of reasons. They kind of get into your lungs and they cause, um, asthma, uh, but they also kind of ca carry viruses and bacteria, et cetera. And so particulates would go up and they would spike around the sensor. And so they went to this place and it turns out they were like lighting incense to worship. And it's like, okay, well, you might not want to get too close to God right now, right? <laughs> like, uh, um, or in this way, there's other ways, but they were lighting incense um, right around the sensor and the, the incense was creating, you know, this, this really, um, this really, crazy in our environment. Now, again, in the grand scheme of things, right? Huge space, little stick of incense, not a big deal. But but that's how people think about this kind of air quality. It's very unspecific, unscientific, but really the impacts on human health, super scientific, lots of studies out there that show the impacts of, of different elements of air and light and, and acoustics on productivity and health. And so there's a lot out there. And, and the challenge we're going to have now that people through the pandemic have been sensitized to this is really bringing that science to the average consumer in a way that that they can understand it and that they can digest it. Right. And and so and then then really developing solutions where I don't have to have the consumer know every scientific detail to implement those solutions where they can just say, Hey, I want a room for an asthmatic child. Can you please dial that in for me?
Yeah. Right. And somebody else who understands the science, who understands the situation can help them really get the best indoor environment. And it's like anything with, if you take the, the whole climate or journey to net zero, whatever your focus is right now, yeah, it's everybody taking personal responsibility to do their bit that will make the big difference overall, right? Absolutely. And there are definitely strategies, just like with anything else, that could give you a really fantastic indoor environment, but could have a really devastating impact on the climate, Mm. which then creates a poorer outdoor environment, which makes you have to work harder to create this really good indoor environment. So I'll I'll give you an example of that. If you live in an urban in an in an urban environment, a lot of times the immediate microclimate around where you live, right, or where you work is not fantastic, right? So so then you get the indoor environment and, and you know, you get guidance that says, hey, you need to ventilate. The easiest way to ventilate is to open a window. Well, if you're out in the country or if you're in a suburban environment, chances are you're out there, your outdoor air is fantastic. And if you open up a window, you're going to create a really great indoor environment. However, if you have an HVAC system, if you've got your air conditioner on, summer, you have your air conditioner on, it's going to have to work harder because you're kind of air conditioning the world, right? All of that cool air sort of goes out of your window um, and the hot air comes in. So it's going to work harder. It's going to use more energy. A lot of those energy, a lot of that energy is still very much fossils. And you're going to start to get a degrading outdoor environment so that even when you now open the window, you're not going to get the environment you want. If you're in an urban environment, you're already there. Yeah. When you open a window in an urban environment, a lot of times you're a lot of the CO2 and all of those things that are accumulated inside, they dilute. That's great. But what you're bringing in could be, could have different, different things Mm. going, uh, going on, right? You could have different pollutants coming in, allergens, smoke, um, VOCs, et cetera, depending on where you are in, in an urban environment. So, it's not easy, right? It's it's not easy. And, and, and your actions as an individual have a direct impact on climate. So if you do one of these things and you have to use more energy to do it, multiply that by 7 billion people. Right. Right. So if everybody and not 7 billion, not, not all 7 billion people have eight, have have air conditioning systems, but a billion. Let's talk about a billion. Right. If everybody opens their windows and keeps their air conditioner on, or if everybody opens their windows, turns it off, then cl- then everything gets hot or everything gets cold, depending on whether or not summer or winter or where you are in the world, then you have to bring down the temperature again or bring up the temperature again. If it's cold, that air conditioning unit is working so much harder multiplied by a billion. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so that's the issue. And that's just homes. Right now, let's talk about um, industrial environments or commercial environments and so on. And so so there are things that if you do them could could give you a negative environment on climate and give you a positive outcome when it comes to indoor environments. And the key is to do to get those indoor environments in a way that also reduces your greenhouse gas footprint, because you don't want to do one at the expense of the other. And that's why, you know, we call it the Center for Healthy and Efficient Spaces. It's because we want to make sure that the actions we're recommending to our clients, we want to make sure that um, the actions that, that I recommend in these podcasts are actions that will have a positive impact on both climate, indoor and outdoor climates. Yeah. It's all about pulling levers and getting balance, isn't it? Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. Now, you mentioned this a little earlier on as you were talking through the different things that we could be thinking about, and you mentioned productivity. Uh-huh. Now, there's a real business case that sits behind this alongside that sustainability case, isn't there? There, there absolutely is. So if you look at a given building, right, let's say you're, you're, you're renting a space in a building or you've, you've got a building and you've got a small business, you're an entrepreneur, um, the the amount of money you spend on energy is a tenth of maybe the amount of money you're going to spend um, on people. Um, it could be as much as a hundredth, right? So, so it's a much smaller amount of money that you're going to spend on things like utilities. And, and that's sort of our proxy for energy consumption, right? But your people are kind of probably going to be one of your biggest assets, 
And the health of those people becomes a huge economic lever for you as a business owner. We know, for example, that um, indoor air quality can have um, a productivity. So indoor air, let's just take indoor air quality as an example. And we can do this. We have studies on lighting. We have studies on acoustics. But I like air for a couple of reasons. You know, product. it's not just about sort of direct productivity every day cognitive function, et cetera. But think about airborne pathogen transmission, which is still, I think, top of mind for a lot of people with um, with the pandemic kind of still raging. Hundreds of billions of dollars a year is lost in productivity due to absenteeism. Right. Same with schools. Then you combine both absenteeism as a result of kids being sick from school. And then there's hundreds of billions more of lost productivity as a result of employees working while sick. Now think about that. If I can reduce, I don't even have to re- make everybody perfectly safe from pathogen transmission. Like I don't need to reduce a hundred percent of pathogen transmission in a building to improve this. If I can just improve the air quality in a building such that I reduce transmission of cold or flu or COVID in this particular case, by 10%, tens of billions, right? 20%, like just think about that. And that those are not big numbers, but if I create these environments in such a way that I can just reduce absenteeism, that's hundreds of billions of dollars. Yeah. Um, that And that's one, just one part of the productivity. We know that um, air quality impacts asthma, chronic illnesses, which reduce productivity without creating absenteeism, right? If you're a chronic sufferer, asthma, um, or or upper respiratory disease, um, that has an impact on your productivity, but also it impacts cognitive function, right? You, you know, as much as 30%, you can have poor indoor air quality and just your ability to process things and do tasks at work goes down dramatically, that's a significant amount of time too, isn't it? Absolutely. And learning, right? So you, we think about school systems and the measures they have on student with student learning. Let's take out absenteeism for a second, right? Like just kids being sick. We found that, um, not we, researchers have found that, um, that the indoor environment can have as significant an impact on test scores as Um, as grades. So just think about public test scores. Um, You want to predict how well a student is going to do on a test, okay, on a public test. Um, There's a number of factors that can give you an indication of of how well that student is going to do. The most most common one we think about is, are they a good student? Do they get good grades? Hmm. That has a really strong correlation with how well they're going to do on these tests. As strong a correlation, how well, how good is their indoor environment? Wow. As strong a correlation on how well they're going to do on this test is whether or not while taking that test, do they have a good indoor environment? And that includes acoustics. It includes lighting and includes air. And so you're, and includes temperature. And so you're thinking about this and you're like, that child's ability to score on a test is, is that dramatically impacted by indoor environments? Hmm. Like, it boggles the mind, right? And these are, I mean, these are scientific studies. They're peer reviewed. They're out there. You can kind of see them. But, but I mean, these are, you know, they've done, a, you know, um, control groups and, and, and testing, uh, doing these things on days where it's good indoor environments, days on bad indoor environments. It's amazing to me. And, that, and that's the type of productivity we're talking about. And so, again, there's so many people on the earth, right? Multiply that yeah. by hundreds of millions or billions. Um, and, and, and you're, you're talking about a huge sort of impact, not just on human health, but also on sort of economic productivity. Yeah. It's amazing. When you start to just think of the tiny little changes we could make and then multiplication across the globe, we can make a massive difference, not just for sustainability, but also productivity and well-being. Absolutely. Really fascinating. And then when you think about just to, just to close this up, when you think about the places that have poor indoor environmental quality 
it's typically those places that don't have a lot of investment. Right. And therefore they're in disadvantaged communities and disadvantaged areas. So it, it exacerbates any equity issues we have. Right. So you just think about social equity and having sort of high quality indoor environments as a, as a human right, almost right. To say, look guys, like kids in school in disadvantaged communities have the cards stacked up against them already. And this is yet another card that's kind of stacked up against um, those who are less fortunate. And so you start to look at the equity impacts of this and how, how, you know, how, how much this exacerbates that. And you start to realize that a lot of where we think about human health and social equity, just, it comes right down to, you know, can I create these indoor environments for, uh, for people in different economic situations in such a way that I'm, I'm leveling the scales a little bit as it relates to, uh, to social equity. So I'm wondering how many of our listeners right now are thinking about their environment as they listen to this. <laughs> right. It'd be really be <laughs> right. interesting to get some feedback from our listeners about that, wouldn't it? Oh, you bet. Yeah. Absolutely. We'd love to hear from listeners on that. So we're going to flip it a little now. And this is where I get to hack into your leadership brain. Awesome. But before I do that, I just wanted to get a sense from you that if I was a listener listening to this mm -hmm. and I was a leader or an entrepreneur, where's the first place I should really start to think? What, what, you know, what's the immediate kind of win that I can make? When it comes to indoor environmental quality, definitely. It, it, so it depends on your situation, right? If you're if you're working you know, from home, if you have control over the environment, definitely start you can start by doing things as simple as um, improving your lighting, right? You can, you know, you can get LED lights pretty much from, from any, um, from any hardware store, you can get dimmers, um, you can improve your lighting, you can con connect to with your, your, your HVAC provider, make sure you have in um, the right number of air changes that you're getting enough ventilation that you've got air quality, that you've got filters, right? Uh, the simplest thing is make sure your filters are changed on a regular basis, um, you know, there's a lot you can do when it comes to uh, to acoustics to insulate um, things like window coverings. And there's I, and, and in fact, there now there's actual window coverings that say on them how much energy they save you. You know, there's a lot you can do when it comes to your own space or the space for your employees. Um, and then you can also consider in room type solutions if you don't have act to, access to those broader systems, right? So we carry an in-room um, air purification solution. You just plug it in and run it and away it goes. And you have to do a little bit of maintenance. You can do an in-room HEPA. You can, can, you can think about opening windows on a regular basis to make sure there's enough ventilation. So there is a lot that can be done by the individual, by a small business, an entrepreneur, um, just by being conscious of this. If you want to do things that are more sophisticated, definitely, you know, connect with um, you would need to connect with a professional. And I would say if you do have a larger business or a larger building, it's not a do it yourself. No. Right. It's yeah. definitely not because you want to make sure you're balancing energy. You make sure you're balancing uh, the different el elements of indoor environmental quality. So definitely if you're a listener and um, you're, you know, you're a building owner or you've got multiple buildings, you're a real estate investor, or you've got sort of a, a, a number of, um, of, of, opportunities to improve people's indoor environments don't try to tackle it yourself definitely reach out to a professional um, and have them come in do an indoor air quality assessment understand or an indoor environmental quality assessment understand where some of the gaps are there's fantastic certifications right um, out there for building performance so whether it's um, whether it's uh, the well uh, certification fit well certification there's a number of, of certifications out there that can be done um, to ensure and to communicate to your tenants that these that these buildings are optimized for indoor environmental quality. Great advice. Good hacks too. <laughs> so leadership hacks time. Awesome. I want you to dive into your experience. You've led businesses all over the world, different types of businesses and different types of teams. And I want to try and get into your top three leadership hacks. What would they be? Um, that's a really good question. So um my leadership hacks are, I think there are things that I do deliberately that if I were to say them, you'd be like, of course, but most people um, probably wouldn't do subconsciously. I know I wouldn't do subconsciously. So the first thing um, I do is um, I, you know, 
in order for so most of the teams that I lead are in are innovative, high, you know, high performing teams. And I think there is a leadership approach that says you have to have a vision and a strategy and you have to have the answers as a leader. And, and the answer is you don't. Um, and it's very um, jarring for employees or for team members that um, are used to kind of having a more autocratic approach. So when I, I take collaborative to the to sort of to the extreme and that, you know, I work with my teams and have for years to build strategies, to build visions. I don't expect that, you know, I don't expect to come up with the vision and kind of have everyone follow. So for me, it's, it's really around early and often with the team talking about the team's vision and the mission and how we want to be seen. And so, so that sort of extreme collaboration, I'm not going to call it delegation, but but really working with your team and giving them ownership of not just the tactical execution, but also of the strategy really for me um, has worked, has worked exceptionally well. Uh, the outcome is a lot better. It's scratchier. And so that's my second sort of le leadership hack, which is um, don't be afraid if people are uncomfortable, don't be afraid to be uncomfortable because that's when kind of the best outcomes are. And I always feel like afterwards, People really appreciate that discomfort. Yeah. I've had a couple of team members that are just, oh my gosh, I never want to do that again. But most of the time, uh, people start to get it and they're like, oh, I get it now. Right. And and it's like there's no epiphany there. It's just they're not, it's it's a it's a really uncomfortable place when there's a lot of disagreement about where to go and, and feels very chaotic, I think, at first. Um, so that's the second one is to really get comfortable with other people's discomfort and your own discomfort, right. Of not having the answers and may, maybe being, being seen as, um, as vulnerable. And I think the third that, and that leads me into my third one, which is really, um, is really sort of leaning into the vulnerability piece with, with teams. And, Again, a lot of times there is this view that the leader has to be a strong leader and and you have to kind of carry the burden. And I don't I don't actually think you do, um, you know, being comfortable with not having the answers, being vulnerable with your team, being very authentic. Like I tend to err on the side of being transparent. Right. And again, for for some people, that's very uncomfortable. But but for a lot of people, I think having that context and transparency, even if it takes a little bit more time matters. And what that then leads me to do is I actually have unstructured time with even during the pandemic, I have a lot of unstructured time with people I interact with. And I, I, I feel like people really appreciate that. So by unstructured time, I mean, like we're in a meeting, it's 30 minutes, it may only take 10 minutes to, to get the work done. But, you know, taking that extra 20 minutes to get to know people, let, having them get to know me being really transparent about what's going on, just in your life just creates this sense of empathy um, with others and with yourself that, that, that gives sort of, and I, I'm going to use a very Southern turn term here that, that allows people to give and get grace, right? Like there's so much of our of business interaction that is very businessy, right? It's very, right. you know, get the work done. Don't waste my time. Time is, and it's like, no, no, there's grace too. like, no one is perfect. And so, if you know people's circumstances, you can give them grace. If you know people's circumstances, you can be empathetic. And so when when they do make mistakes or if, if deadlines are missed, there's a, a very sort of collaborative approach to it versus being very adversarial. And I think that comes with really getting to know people and showing them that kind of that grace um, in interaction. And so those are my, I know they're very wishy-washy, but those are my top three. Awesome advice. No, not wishy-washy at all. <laughs> the next part of the show, we call it hack to attack. Uh -huh. This is typically where something in your life or your work hasn't worked out, but there's a real learning that's come from that and it serves you well. What would be your hack to attack? I, I thought I, didn't I, didn't I already share the time I almost died? Like that was my, that was my thing in life <laughs> that, that didn't, that didn't work out well. Um, but you know, I, that, that to me is probably the standout one I've had many sort of things that haven't worked out well. Um, I, uh, I tell people, so we, you know, in innovation, you tend to have something called a pipeline conversion, which is how many things have to fail before something's fail is a bad word, but how many things don't turn out the way you expect it uh, before you kind of have something succeed. Right. And um, for me, there's a, I look at it like, 
if you're if things don't break when you're doing them, you're probably not taking enough risk. Yeah, exactly right. And so things go wrong around me all the time. Right. And the question just is, what are you learning from that? And how are you turning that kind of into a positive experience? And and I feel like I do that all the time. I've had a couple of big ones. Probably the biggest is when, you know, you expect your body to do something and it doesn't want to comply. Like you expect your body to breathe and it doesn't want to breathe. That's not a good thing. But but I did learn a lot um, around um, around sort of work-life balance or work-life management, whatever you want to call it, making choices about who to work for, where to work, um, and, and being sort of understanding that you're blessed enough to be able to make those choices. Cause that again, leads to a lot of grace, um, when it comes to interact working with others. So, so for me, it's hard to point to one thing outside of almost dying. Yeah. Nearly dying kind of does it though, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. That kind of trumps everything yeah. you possibly exactly. could do. <laughs> so now the last thing we get to do, you get to do some time travel, uh-huh. bump into Russia at 21, give us some advice. Uh-huh. What would it be? Don't color your hair. That's, <laughs> a, <laughs> that's the advice. Uh, I don't know if you've If seen you have it. hair, of course. If you yeah. have hair, of course. But me at 21, I did, and I had a lot of it, and it was starting to turn gray. I remember at 21, I was starting <laughs> to get gray, and I was obsessed with coloring the gray, and, and, um, and it led to about 20 years of hair damage, which I have now um, re- thankfully reversed. No, um, hey, but it's on a serious note, though, that's really serious yeah, that, advice. If it starts to happen is, to you, it, it can change your future outcomes for sure. Yeah, well, that's that's it. I mean, it, it, for me, it does come down to um, to sort of being really authentic as a leader. I don't color your hair is just a euphemism for that. But, um, you know, at 21, man, I just graduated college. Um, it was my first kind of job. I was still a competitive martial artist and uh, appearances really mattered and they kind of don't, don't anymore. But, um, hey, talking of which, Little Bird tells me you were actually a national karate champion. Is that right? I was. I yeah. was. And um, and so I, I will tell you at 21, I was pretty oblivious to a lot of stuff going on around me. And I, I grew up a very in a very sheltered sort of high school. It was a small girls finishing school in the Middle East. And, you know, my class, my graduating class is like 10 people. Um, so I was very sheltered when I when I went to college. I didn't have the same college experience as everyone else. But um, but I will say, I, you know, at 21, that would be the one thing is, is sort of, um, you know, while I would say at 21, I was definitely judged differently because I didn't have a lot of the credibility I have now. Um, I do feel like I spent an inordinate amount of time sort of, um, maintaining appearances and I was very naive. Um, and I, and I feel like one, I trusted people too much, but at the same time, I felt like, um, I only trusted them so far, which was kind of the worst, the worst of both worlds, right? So you're either all in, like you're all in on being kind of your authentic self and you're kind of over the top or you're sort of super reserved. And it's kind of in the middle that make, that confuses people a lot. And I was definitely in the middle for a long time before I embraced um, being, being all in on, uh, on authenticity. So I'm, I'm glad I did that, but that, that would be the, that would be the one thing, uh, negotiate your salary. That would be another thing. Like, <laughs> yes, you can negotiate and no, that's not enough. Um, and, uh, and this, the third thing was, was, I would say would be, um, definitely look at work relationships differently than I did. I would say I probably didn't understand the role of sponsors and mentors and, and sort of those work, call it friendships. Um, I didn't understand how important they were um, at tw- at 21. And I made some sort of real mistakes in terms of getting that kind of sponsorship um, early on. And so t- it took me some time to get there, but that's it. That's what I would say. Some great advice for people listening to this for sure. Yeah. So how do we get people who are listening to this to connect with you and train technologies? Where's the best place to send them? So a couple of things, um, definitely they, they can reach out. We can, uh, we can go to train technologies, uh, dot com. I think 
is is what it is now. Um, the Center for Healthy and Efficient Spaces um, has a spot under sustainability there. Um, and and you can definitely connect via uh, the inbox. In fact, that will likely get a faster response since, um, since the team definitely monitors that. Um, and there's a lot of great resources on the Center for Healthy and Efic- Efficient Spaces. All of those numbers I quoted about productivity, uh, we have a primer on indoor environmental quality if people want to learn more. So they, th- I, I would definitely recommend they go to the Train Technologies website um, and look us up at Center for Healthy and Efficient Spaces. We'll drop those links into our show notes as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Arshia, thanks ever so much for taking time. And I know you have a really, really busy schedule. So I am super grateful that we've been able to connect and get you on the show. Thanks for uh, being part of the community. I appreciate it as well. I know this is um, you. You've got a lot of fantastic guests and uh, this is a, fa- a great, a great podcast. So thank you for having me and help, helping us tell our story. Thank you, Russia. I want to sign off by saying a thank you to you for joining us on the show, too. We recognize without you, there is no show. So please continue to share, subscribe and like and continue to get in touch with us with the great news stories that we share every week. And so that we can continue to bring you great stories, please make sure you give us a five-star review where you can and share this podcast with your friends, your teams, and your communities. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Leadership Hacker, Leadership Hacker on YouTube, and on Instagram, the underscore leadership underscore hacker. And if that wasn't enough, you can also find us on our website, leadership-hacker.com. Tune in to next episode to find out what great hacks and stories are coming your way. That's me signing off. I'm Steve Rush, and I've been your Leadership Hacker.